Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to present our work on the novelty paradox and uh, bias for normal science. Um, this is joint work together with Kareem Lakhani from London Business School, Eva Ginnan here from Harvard Medical School, and Kareem Lakhani from Harvard Business School. Um, what is the motivation for this work? Um, peer review um, in which scientists evaluate each other's papers really is the single mode that we have these days which we use to allocate research funding. Here in the US, the NIH and the NSF together give out more than $30 billion every year um, in, in research funding which is allocated through peer review. Uh, similar in the European Union, the ERC does the same. And this peer review evaluation process not just determines who gets funded, but also where on the scientific frontier this money gets allocated. And this is particularly important since we know, for example, that uh, if you're in the natural sciences and you have an idea and that idea does not get funded, then in most cases you never end up doing that work in the first place. And despite the fact that this peer review evaluation is so important, it's actually not very well understood yet. And to start this whole thing off, I want to give you an example in which the peer review process kind of led to a uh, suboptimal um, outcome, and that example is taken from Peer's excellent work. Um, so this is a picture of Mario Capacci, and he's working at the University of Utah. And in 1980, he had an idea and submitted a research proposal to uh, NIH. And he suggested to basically work on three projects. And two of these projects were building on his past prior work. And one was a radical new idea in which he proposed to create knockout mice. So mice uh, that were genetically modified so that you could knock out certain genes. And the evaluation group basically decided, yeah, we should probably give him the grant, but they strongly recommended that he should drop this new idea and he should only work on the other two. Um, he does the exact opposite. He works only on this new idea and drops the two other projects. And he's very successful. He creates these knockout mice. And in 2007, he is awarded the Nobel Prize for it. All right, so preview of the results. Um, so the research question that we're going to address is do evaluators treat novel proposals differently? Um, and in order to answer this research question, we devised a field experiment, which was basically layered onto an existing grant exercise at a large medical school. Um, it was set in the field of type one diabetes and we basically designed how $1 million in research funding are going to be allocated. And through that process, we received 150 research proposals. We recruited 142 evaluators, faculty members, who would review these grant proposals. Um, we randomly assigned the proposals to the reviewers. And on the way, we basically collected a micro-level data set with data from this experiment, but also prior observational data on the past publication history of the evaluators and the submitters. What do we find? Uh, we find a pretty large systematic discount for novelty. So if your research proposal that you submit is more novel, you get lower evaluation scores. This finding is rather robust to um, a variety of different econometrical specifications of the model and other robustness tests that you could do. And the effect is pretty large. Um, so a one standard deviation increase in novelty makes you, in our setting with 150 proposals, makes you drop six ranks. And if you assume a typical funding cutoff uh, at NIH of, say, the top 10% of the proposals, in our case that would be 15 getting funded. If you drop six ranks, that can easily make or break your proposal. All right. Um, what I want to go through with you is um, some more details on the experiment that we designed, uh, how we measured the whole thing, especially how we measure novelty, um, and some of the findings. 
So as I mentioned, this was layered onto an existing uh, grant exercise at a large medical school. Um, and we specifically chose the area of type 1 diabetes because it's like a very neatly coherent field and it's like not a, not a artificial kind of boundary, boundary around the, the type of proposals being submitted. Um, in order for this whole thing to work, um, we needed large variation in the proposals. So if you want to measure the impact of novelty, you actually need to make sure that you get some that are more novel and some that are less novel. Um, so we not only designed how we would evaluate those proposals, but also the proposal we would solicit in the first place. Uh, so we had an open call uh, inside and across the university. So basically everyone was allowed to submit ideas. Um, and through that, we received 150 proposals. Then we specifically recruited the evaluators based on their past publication history. So specifically, we chose experts in the field of type 1 diabetes and people who had not so much experience with type 1 diabetes research. And then we all did this in a random assignment process, and contrary to how NIH and NSF do their review, this was all not just double blind, but also triple blind, meaning that also the evaluators did not know who the other evaluators were. Um, the whole idea behind this exercise was to keep social influence out of the picture and really see how evaluators would treat the proposals themselves. So here's some overview of the, the data that we have. Um, about 50% of the proposals that we received came from within the university. The other 50% came from outside the university. Um, for those from inside the university, we have a little bit more data. Uh, for those, for example, we know that the average publications of the submitters were nine, so nine publications on average, and about 70% of those had published on type 1 diabetes previously. And then the proposals themselves, they had a huge variation in how long they were, how many citations and references they used, whether they used images and figures and all these kinds of things. So a huge variation. Some data on the evaluators. So all the evaluators were recruited from inside the university. Um, Half of them were senior evaluators, full professors and associate professors. The other half were more junior investigators, um, such as uh, assistant professors. Um, everyone had either a PhD or MD or both. And as I mentioned earlier, they were specifically recruited to span experts in the field of type 1 diabetes and outside the type 1 diabetes area. Um, each evaluator rated 15 proposals. So in total, that gives us a data set of 2,130 proposal evaluator pairs. And for each of these pairs, every evaluator rated both the impact, like how impactful would this research be if successfully executed, and what the feasibility of the research proposal was. All right. One key issue in this whole thing is how do we actually measure novelty? And uh, we already heard a very interesting paper earlier this morning. Um, for one approach, and ours is actually quite similar. Um, so we again rely on this idea that novelty is a recombinatorial process. So something is very new if it's a combination of two things that have not been combined before. So whereas Brian used um, co-citation, so two papers from two different journals being cited together as his measure, uh, we rely on keywords. So um, when two keywords appear together that have not appeared together before, then we consider this novel. And the setting of biomedical research um, has actually a very excellent um, keyword system. It's called medical subject headings. Um, it's uh, a strictly uh, managed terrasaurus of keywords, um, and those are 
centrally assigned to all papers in the field by trained librarians. So they are not submitted by the authors, but they are centrally assigned. So that makes it uh, a nice tool to use for, for these purposes. Um, so we hired one of these librarians to do the same mesh keyword coding with our 150 proposals so that we have a comparable baseline. And then our idea of novelty is um, that a keyword pair is novel if it has not appeared before. And then we do this for all possible pairs and we take the percentage of that. The challenge there, of course, is that we are trying to capture a rather complex multidimensional attributes such as novelty in a single statistic. Um, I guess that's just something that we have to live with. We're trying to do that. Um, and as the baseline, we are using PubMed, which uh, at the time we did this had 22 million papers. And so that's our, our representation of the body of knowledge. Uh, I give you an example how this works. Um, so imagine you have a research proposal that has three mesh keywords on it, type 1 diabetes, insulin, and zebrafish. So we create all the pairs and we look in PubMed to see how many papers we'll find. Uh, diabetes and insulin, not surprisingly, 10,000 papers, not very novel. For insulin and zebrafish, there are 34, quite less, but still has appeared before, so not novel. Um, but diabetes and zebrafish, there are zero papers. Um, so that's a new pair. And then the whole proposal would get a novelty score of 0.33. So one out of three pairs being unique. Um, this all together gives us a great data set of experimental data, the, all the rating data, and then um, our measure of novelty coming out of the comparison with the body of knowledge in PubMed along with additional control measures such as prior publication history of all the evaluators. For the empirical strategy, um, it's important to note um, how the ideal experiment that you would want to run would look like. Um, what you would ideally want to do is compare evaluators' reactions to the same a set of match proposals that differ only in novelty. So it's the same proposal, but it differs in novelty. We cannot really do this because if a proposal differs in novelty, it's not the same proposal anymore. So the ideal thing we just can't do. Um, the next best thing that we can do is we can compare um, different proposals given to the same evaluator and we can compare across a set of different proposals that just vary in novelty. For all the rest that might be confounded with novelty, such as maybe quality, you might think, for those we have to try to control in uh, using control measures and econometric approaches. So that's what we're going to do. What do we find? Um, first, show you graphically. Uh, so that's the relationship between the novelty of the research proposal and the evaluation score that has been assigned to that. The scores were between one and 10, 10 being the highest. And you can see with increasing novelty, the evaluation score goes down. Um, and this is true for both the linear model, the blue line with the confidence interval around it. Um, but this is also true for a more uh, flexible semi-parametric specification. And you can see, especially in the tail end of extreme novelty, the evaluation scores really go down. Um, of course, we then try to do this in a regression framework as well. Um, so the dependent variable here is the evaluation score assigned by an evaluator to a given proposal. Our key explanatory variable is our measure of novelty. And then we basically use a set of different control measures uh, either to control for how we created the measure of novelty in the first place or things that we think might be confounded with uh, novelty. So say in model one, um, we find a statistically significant coefficient of novelty. Uh, it's negative, so higher novelty leads to lower scores. Um, and then we move on to add a control measure, specifically how we constructed the novelty measure in the first place. Um, 
one key input into the novelty measure is the mesh keywords themselves, right? And so not every proposal has the same number of mesh keywords on it, so we need to control for that, so um, we do that. Um, when we move to model two, we add additional controls and more flexible measures of doing that, and basically as we go from model one through model five, you can see that the coefficient of novelty does not really change. Um, in the paper, we then do a lot of additional robustness tests, um, and basically what we are trying to see is, um, say we take model five, which we think is kind of our best specification, um, and we basically try to see if there's anything we could throw at the model that would make this minus 2.2 coefficient go away. Um, so we have controls for quality, for example, we have other controls for how we constructed the measure, and we are working on um, doing an even better job at that and trying to uh, really establish that this is driven by novelty and not confounded with something else. So that's what we're currently working on. Um, and this is basically it. Uh, I want to summarize. So. Um, the ideal experiment you would want to run to get at this effect of how do evaluators treat novelty, it's just not possible. So uh, you have to do the next best thing, which um, in our case, we ran an experiment, we randomly assigned research proposals to evaluators and try to see how they react to novelty. Overall, we find a robust across the board discounting for novelty, higher scores of novelty lead to lower evaluation scores. And this is only in part explained by additional other factors such as the feasibility, for example, of the proposal. Um, and so we really see this as kind of an, one approach of looking at Kuhn's idea of an incrementalism in, in science and scientists preferring to do incremental things rather than new things. That's it. Thank you very much. Question. Um, so the question was whether we, so we measure novelty, but did we just ask the evaluators to assess novelty and see whether, for example, our measure of novelty would correlate with the evaluator's assessment of novelty? And that's kind of the point of running a field experiment. You plan it and you think about a lot of things and then you run it and then in the end you have to stare at your feet and you're like, we really didn't think of that. Um, so no, we did not do that. It, would have been easy um, had we thought of it at that time. Um, so we're kind of thinking of going back to the evaluators and asking them, or maybe ask someone else, a control group, uh, if you wish, um, for their assessment. Um, yeah, excellent point. Should have done it, didn't. Yes, go ahead. Just an observation. You know, the way you're looking at novelty is not unlike the way genetics was, except you're looking at profits and Yeah. So, well, even worse, 
Yes, go ahead. Daniel Kahneman points out the same thing in his book. Uh, yeah. Uh, loss is uh, considered much uh, you know, higher than this. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. That was great.